But it's so lovely to be here. Uh, it's always my favorite place to come back to, not just Stockton, but Destiny specifically. I love it so much that I brought my housemate, Amy, along. I clearly talk about you guys so well. She was desperate to come and see you in person. Uh, and so thank you to everyone for making a full welcome. And we've also got Pauline and Chloe here. We've got like, the Glaswegians are taking over. We will offer translation devices if you need it. Uh, but we've loved this weekend getting to show them around the Northeast. Now, don't get me wrong, when they're in the car, I do make them cover their eyes as we go through the high street, open them at Yarm, close their eyes as we travel, and then open them again at Durham. Isn't the Northeast beautiful? Uh, but it's the people that really make us, isn't it? Uh, I've loved it though, and as we've been traveling around, it made me realize that so often we forget what we should remember and remember what we should forget. Let me tell you what I mean. So as we're on the drive and we're coming up and it's like three and a half hours from where we currently live to Stockton, it's a lot of time for Amy to listen to me talk. Uh, and uh, I'm telling stories all about destiny. I'm telling her all about everything that we've done here. My 24 years, I had to think then how old I was, 24 years of being involved in destiny. And I wish, I just wish the thing that came to my mind first was the incredible ministry we have here at Destiny. I wish it was the powerful preaching. I wish it was the work of the Moses Project. I wish it was the incredible connect groups we have. But for some reason, that did come. It was just a little further down the list. The first thing I remembered was in 2009 when my dad did a sermon dressed as a mummy. I don't know if... <laughs> I don't know if any of you were here at that time. I can't even remember what the sermon was about. I just remember he dressed as a mummy. My dad seriously wishes I forgot that. Or the other story that I remembered, and I don't know why, is uh, does anyone remember when diversity came to Stockton? If you don't remember, well, if you, this is before my time. Stockton's got a history in dance. So we watch us in worship. We are going for it. And so diversity came to get Stockton dancing again. And they wanted to hire this building. And so my mom got a call saying, we've got a TV crew that want to come around and have a little look at the building. My mom, we get these regularly from like local TV stations. So she didn't think much of it. She said, yeah, yeah, go for it. Come on over. And so Ashley Banjo rocks up. And my mom's like... I recognize you, but I cannot work out where from. She's like, have you ever been to Destiny? And he's like, ah, actually, no, I don't think I have. She's like, you, I know you from somewhere. Like, have you been to an Alpha course? Have you been? He's like, no, no. And my mum, who is terrible at celebrities, all she could think of is at the time, I really loved a little bit of JLS. She thought, you must be from that boy band, JLS, which Ashley very politely, probably started singing everybody in love, I don't know. I was at school and got a text from my mum, like, I met JLS with a selfie in her of Ashley Banjo, and I was like, oh, no, mum. I don't know why I remember these stories, but I find that the same in the natural, the way that we remember the things we wish we would forget and forget the things like birthdays and anniversaries we really need to remember. I think the same happens spiritually. So often we forget the things that God's done that we need to remember and remember the things that people have spoken over us as kids that really God's trying to break, break off and we need to forget. And so what I see myself as today is a bit of a spiritual alarm clock. Like nobody's ever really excited about alarm clock going off either. No one, I've never heard anyone like, what are you doing today? <sighs> going shopping for my, uh, my brand new alarm clock, you know, really can't wait to find one. It's just one of those things we don't really like, but we all rely on every day. Because you don't realize you're sleeping until it goes off and wakes you up. In the same way that we don't realize we've forgotten until you suddenly remember. And this morning I want to come as a spiritual alarm clock to say, Destiny, it is not time for us to fall asleep. It's not time for us to get comfortable and sit back. But it's time for us to put a little firecracker up our butt. To sit up a little bit higher. And to realize that God has still got things he's wanting to do. We've got miracles that have gone before us. We're sitting in the building that is a miracle, but this is not the end. God is still wanting to move. And so we're going to look a little bit at the feeding of the 5,000 today, Do you, but we're going to uh, pray first before we jump into Mark chapter 6. Will you pray with me? 
Jesus, we thank you that you're here. We thank you that you're already speaking. You're already moving. God, I pray that this morning you will help all of us to lean in and to listen to what you're speaking directly to us. I pray that all of us who are tired, all of us that are just feeling a little bit weary in our faith, all of us that are thinking, I'm not really sure I really want to be here right now. God, I pray that you will just give us an encounter with you. Help us to know your presence, your passion, your love, your grace here in this moment. Amen. Well, I'm going to jump in at Mark chapter 6, which is titled The Feeding of the 5,000. I always think it's a little bit of a spoiler alert when they call a subheading like the bit that's coming right at the end. Uh, but we're going to look at The Feeding of the 5,000. If you've never uh, heard of this before, um, then Jesus often is known to gather large crowds around him. He doesn't really, you know, do it on purpose. He's just chilling. He's just being Jesus. Uh, and people love Jesus. So people rock up and he's got thousands gathered around him. And it tells us that he takes compassion on them because he sees them as sheep without a shepherd. He sees all these people and no one's helping them, no one's teaching them, no one's showing them how to live. And so Jesus begins teaching uh, them all the things that they need to know. And then it gets a little bit later in the day, like the same way that if I'm not done by dinner time, I'm sure some of you will come up to me and let me know as well. Uh, and so the disciples go up to Jesus and we're going to jump in at 35 to let them know He's ran over a little bit too long and everyone's hungry. It says this, verse 35, by this time it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him, this is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go uh, to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than, uh, than half a year's wages are we to go and spend that much in bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit in groups of, on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he uh, gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the, fish in, uh, the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up the 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who ate was 5,000. We're often now where we've come to realize that they only counted the men uh, back then. So although we we're going to refer to it as the feeling of the 5,000, there was the women and the children there, and they expected to be between 15 to 20,000 that were actually there that are fed. But what I find fascinating by this is that the disciples looked and said, this is a remote place. But then a couple of lines later, Jesus looks and declares this same place a place of green grass. The disciples see the problem and Jesus sees an opportunity. And now, many, many years later, we refer to the same place as where the feeding of the 5,000 is done. We remember the provision of God. I find it fascinating that when the disciples are faced with the problem, the questions that they choose to ask. I think that often worry in our life comes from asking the wrong questions. The disciples are like, well, hey, we're in a remote place. Where on earth is a shop around here? It's like past 4 p.m. It's a Sunday. Jesus, do you not know how it goes down in Stockton? Like, it's closed. You're not going to find anything. Potentially a bells, but they're not going to have the kind of bread we want. And they're like, it's a remote place. We don't have this money. Like, how on earth are we going to be able to do this? The questions are all wrong. We see this again in, in Matthew 6.31 when it says, don't go around asking, what will I eat? What will I drink? what will I wear? Why? These are the wrong questions. These are the questions that those who don't know Jesus ask. But as for me and you, we have a new question. How do I pursue God's righteousness? How do I pursue God's kingdom in my life? There's a better question. Imagine if the disciples realized, well, like, right, Jesus, everyone's getting a bit hungry. What's the plan? Jesus, how, how, how can I be involved? What, what would it look like if they asked a better question? But Jesus takes the loads of pity and grace on them and he corrects the question slightly. He says, how many loaves do you have? 
That's a bit of a better question. What have you got? But sometimes it's easier for us to complain about what we don't have than to take inventory of what we do have. And so Jesus says, go away. Go find what you do have. Because he only asked for loaves, but all of a sudden, once they start looking, they start finding a little bit more. They come back with some fish as well. Jesus never asked about that. But once you start looking, you start to find more than you realize. When you start looking for reasons to be grateful, you will find more than you realize. When you start looking for ways to be generous, you will find more than you ever realized were there. When you start looking at ways that you can show love on people, you'll start to find more ways than you'd ever realized were there. And this is one of the only miracles that's actually presented in all four of the Gospels outside of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And in some of the other accounts of the Gospel, we see that the, uh, the loaves and the fish were offered by a, a small uh, boy. Uh, and I love that we remember this boy in some of the accounts because uh, this boy so willingly offered what he had. Like, I sometimes, when I'm reading the Bible, try and put myself in the story. And I imagine, I've sat in a room of 5,000 people, but obviously we know there was, there was more. But I've sat in a room of 5,000 people, and I imagine someone going, guys, catering is down. Like, anyone got anything? And I would look at my pack of lunch and think, well, I'm all right, Jack. Like, I, no part of me would think, well, I'm sure this is going to you know, work the magic and, and, and reach everyone. At no point would it cross my mind to give what I had because I find that adults are often kids that have just learned limitation. And so and I'm that person that, you know, I know when it says, like, this cake's going to feed 24, it feeds two. Like, I, I've learned portion control. Uh, but this boy, who's clearly never done any catering uh, in his life, saw his five loaves and his two fish and gave them so willingly to Jesus. But God in himself is self-sufficient. It's the very definition of being God. He doesn't require anyone else. He doesn't need anyone else. He is never reliant upon anyone else for him. I mean, if God needs something, he speak it into being. That's the way he created everything around him. So for God to use this boy, it's not because Jesus needed the five loaves and the two fish, but it was an opportunity for the boy to partner in the miracle that God was about to do. I sometimes wonder, what if another person had offered what they had? Like, imagine if we read about the old woman at the back who had some chicken teriyaki and a Kit Kat, and now we're all telling the story of the chicken teriyaki and the Kit Kat for years to come. Why? Because Jesus can use anything, but it's our opportunity to offer what we have to get to be a part of the story. It's never about how much you have. It's about your opportunity, your uh, ability to... to uh, Give it to God to be used. Sometimes as well, when I think about this story of the feeding of the 5,000, I think the reason why we're so in awe of it is because it's such a big number, like 5,000 people. Like, that's, like, I can't imagine trying to cook for 5,000 people if I did have the ingredients, let alone if you brought me five loaves of bread. Like that, that is pretty miraculous what God has done. But even if the boy had brought 4,999 loaves of bread and Jesus just had to produce one, that would be miraculous. Like how many times have you been at the bottom of your chocolate box and you're thinking, if I could just produce one more. Like just one more Jesus, I'd be really set for life. Like I'd be happy. Like if he just could produce one more piece of bread out of thin air, that is still miraculous. But we probably wouldn't be as amazed by it. We'd have probably been like, mm, I bet he ripped one in half. You know, we'd raisin it away somewhere. I bet he quickly nipped to like Tesco. We'd have something to reason it away. But the fact that the boy offered so little and Jesus made it so much, now that's something we will remember. It's the same in mine and your life. Often we excuse ourselves from being used by God because we don't have much. But if we have to realize that actually the less you have, the better. Because the less attention is on you and the more that is on Jesus, the more glory he's given. We don't remember the boy for having a great memory and, you know, packing in case of an emergency. We remember Jesus for the miracle that he did. If anything, the less you have, the better. There's no excuses. 
I find that sometimes when we talk about being used by God, we can swing to two sides. What sometimes we, we feel really great about ourselves. We're like, I know, Jesus can use me. Like, have you seen the way I sing? Like, I have got a ministry. And we can swing to, swing to feeling really superior. Or other people can swing the other way and feel like they have nothing to offer God and start to feel really inferior. But to be honest with you, I don't think the enemy minds which side you swing on as long as you're on one of them because both are fixated on yourself and not on the God we serve. You see, it never happened, the multiplication, while it was in uh, Jesus' hands. They gave the, uh, while it was in the boys' hands, sorry, it did happen in Jesus' hands. It didn't happen while it was in the boys' hands. The boy came and he uh, brought his bread and they found the fish and they have to give them uh, to Jesus But so often I find that we hold on to something and we ask Jesus to bless it and to multiply it, but we don't want to really give it up. We want to keep control over it at first. But the boy trusted God. He gave, uh, the, he gave Jesus his, um, his bread and his loaves, and then Jesus breaks it. How many of us can agree that sometimes we give Jesus something and first it's broken? Like we give Jesus our heart and then he breaks it for the lost. We give Jesus uh, our ministry and then he starts to break some pride off us. We give Jesus ourself and he starts to break us from thinking that we can do it by ourselves. Jesus often will go through a breaking and then he blesses it. And he gives the bread back to his disciples See, the bread didn't like, it wasn't like popping candy, like, you know, popcorn machine going off, like, the boy's giving it to Jesus, everyone, grab a basket, catch, like, we can't, we can't grab it, the bread's going everywhere. Like, Jesus gives the bread back to the disciples and says, okay, now go and distribute it. The disciples, I'd have probably been looking at it, like, does, does Jesus, how, how much are we given? Like, portion control, you know, what, one by each, um, how far is that going to get us? But the disciples just start trusting and walking out, trusting that with every person, the bread is going to be multiplied into more and more. Every step thinking, is this going to be the one where it runs out? They had to trust God. We see the same principle in 2 Kings 4 with the woman uh, uh, and the, the widow's oil. There was a woman whose husband had died and um, she was worried that she couldn't pay her bills and she thought her sons might be taken as slaves to compensate. Uh, And so she runs to this man called Elisha and she's like, Elisha, will you help me? What do I do? I can't afford anything. And Elisha does the same thing. He's like, there's a better question. What do you have? She says, I've got nothing. Just a jar of oil. Elisha's like, great, Jesus can work with that. He says, go back and ask everyone you know for empty jars and then take them back home and take your little jar of oil and begin to pour. And before you know it, it's going to fill every single jar up and then sell those jars and there's your money. What it doesn't say is great. Why, you've got some oil. If you just go back, I've got M&S Finest stocked up in all your cupboards that you're going to walk in. Wow, it's a miracle. Uh, Now just start selling that with the exchange rate nowadays from 2023 M&S oil. It'll be great. Like uh, the woman had to trust to go and ask for empty jars, looking at her little jar thinking, I'm still not convinced it's going to be enough and step out in faith. I love the story of the feeding of the 5,000. But you know, this actually isn't what this sermon's about. I wanted to touch on a few points from it because I think it's so much that we can learn from it. Uh, But the feeding of the 5,000, I just wanted to address it so it's fresh in your mind. I just want you to be thinking about what Jesus has done. I want you to be thinking about if you were a disciple, how would you feel in that moment of doubting that we've got no food and Jesus like miraculously coming through and feeding everyone. I want you to remember this so clearly in your mind because we're going to flick over what is just one page in my Bible to chapter 8. Just one page away, we see a very similar situation. We see again Jesus has been teaching a large crowd for three days at this point. Like imagine if someone preached for three days and you didn't realize you hadn't eaten. 
That's got to be good. And so Jesus has been speaking for three days, and these people have not eaten. And Jesus is like bringing it to land. He's ready to like wrap this up. But he realizes he can't send them away because for some of them have traveled so far that they're going to collapse on the way home without food. And so Jesus is like, we need to, we need to get them some food. It's a bit of a deja vu situation. In verse 4, when Jesus is like, right, how are we going to feed them? The disciples said this. See if you can recognize it. Verse 4, uh, the disciples say, his disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Like, wait, 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 one second. They've just seen the feeding of the 5,000. They've still got a bit of fish in their teeth. Their stinky breath is there to Jesus going, where in this remote place will we find any bread? Like, let's backtrack. What have they seen Jesus do by this point? By Mark chapter 8, they've seen Jesus cast out demons. They've seen Jesus heal many, many people. They've seen Jesus calm the storm. Like, imagine, like, that's not even weather forecast. That's beyond. Like, he just gets up like, I'm trying to sleep. Like, Jesus calms the storm. He walks on water. He raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. And if that wasn't enough, he's just fed 5,000 people. And now you sit in a room full of 4,000 people and you are doubting. Like, I get it the first time. I get it the first time. The first time you're like, oh, we've never been in this situation before. What are we going to do, Jesus? What's up your sleeve? But like the second time, strategically, Dunedin would be on it. I'd be like, I've got team t- t-shirts printed. Let's go. I've like tipped it out. 50s, 100s, gluten-free, Warburton white. Like we're so at Jesus. If you want to just do your thing. Like I've already got some stewards here. Prayer team for the response are there. Like we've got it sorted. Like second time round, I know what's about to go down. But the disciples have the same response, like they've just forgotten what's happened. I think we can do it so often ourselves. We can stress in situations we've just been in that God's brought us through. Where where are we going to get this money from, Jesus? You've asked me to start tithing, but I don't know. But do you remember how he did it last month? Jesus, I, I just, I don't know what I'm going to do with a job. I'm just feeling really stressed. But do you remember what he did last time you needed a job? Jesus, I just feel like we really need some healing. I'm really struggling. But do you remember what he did last time? We so quickly forget what God has done. In verse 5, we see Jesus does the same thing. He's like, okay, let's go back to this. There's a better question. How many loaves do you have? The disciples say, seven. Like, They were just feeding 5,000 people, and they had five loaves. And now they're feeding 4,000 people. I'll do the maths for you. That's less people. And they've got seven loaves of bread. That's more bread. They've got less people, more bread. I'd be like, we're in for a feast right now. But you see, the problem is the disciples are still stressed because your attitude isn't dictated by the amount you have. How many of us sometimes think, If I just have a little bit more money, then I'll tithe. If I just have a little bit more time, then I'd go to Connect Group every week. If I just had a little bit more margin in my day, then I would read the Bible and pray with Jesus. If I just had a little bit more faith, then I'd maybe invite a friend to Alpha Course. If I just had a little bit more, then I would, you fill in the gaps. But the disciples here have got more. And have the same attitude. And so I I think that often we need to realize that the amount won't change our attitude. Our attitude is set. If you can't be generous with the small, you won't be generous with the big. If you can't love with the few people around you, you won't be able to love when you have got a big family around you. You've got to learn in the small uh, so that it comes through the big. And so we see again, the feeling of the 4,000 goes down the same. In verse 6, we see Jesus uh, sits down the crowd. He gives bread. He breaks the bread. Disciples distribute it. Everyone's satisfied. There's leftovers uh, again. And then, you're thinking right now, like now they get it. Fame of the 5,000, 
we've done that. Feeding of the 4,000, they've just seen that happen. And then just a few verses later, yeah, in verse 14, the disciples, like Jesus has wrapped this up, the crowd are going home. Jesus jumps into the boat with the disciples uh, and Jesus tells them uh, to be aware, uh, to be aware, uh, yeah, to be aware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Yeast, as we all know, is just a little fungi that when you put a tiny bit in a dough of bread, it impacts the whole bread, like the whole loaf. It's used often in the Bible as a metaphor for pride because it puffs you up. It's used for sin and unbelief. And so when Jesus is saying, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, the Pharisees represent the religious system and Herod represents the political system. So what Jesus is saying is don't start to take your confidence, don't start to get a little bit arrogant that your religion's looking good, that your politics is looking good. That's not where your faith is found. That's not where we place our confidence in. And the disciples hear Jesus talking about yeast and they think, oh no, we forgot the bread. Like, oh, where are we going to get bread? And so the disciples begin to panic that they forgot bread because they've only got one loaf between 13 people. They've just seen the feeding of the 5,000. They've just seen the feeding of the 4,000. They literally hop into a boat. Jesus chats about yeast as you do, and they go in to sheer panic. Where is the bread? They still don't get it. But Jesus is going, don't you see? I am the bread of life. Don't you see? As long as I'm in your boat, you don't need anything else. Don't you realize that whatever you're going through, it will always be enough because Jesus is there with you. The disciples have missed who Jesus is. And I know we can say, we often look at the disciples and think, oh, disciples, imagine if I was there, I'd know what I was doing. Although it's only taken me five years to study some of these scriptures to realize how I would like to respond. Uh, and they didn't have that time. But I, we often look at the disciples and we can roll our eyes, but we do the same. We so quickly forget what God has done for us. And we go in prayer and start complaining about the same situation when Jesus is going, I just wish you had a little bit more faith. Like for me, if I've just seen Jesus feed 5,000, I really hope my next miracle isn't 4,000. I'm praying for 100,000. I want my faith to keep growing and building. I don't want to be in the same situation every time it comes along. Because when the miracle happened, the benefit of that miracle wasn't just for the little boy who gave his food. It wasn't just for the disciples who needed a little bit of an object lesson from Jesus. It was for every single person who received some bread and every single person who's still reading that story now. The multiplication of that bread is the same way that God's saying when you remember what God does, he multiplies that throughout your life. When God does something in you, it's not just for you. He wants to get it through you because now I stand on the testimonies of my parents, of my grandparents, of the people in the church who've told me what God's done in their life and it builds my faith. And now I stand and pass it on to the next generation and it's getting multiplied. And so I want to challenge you, Destiny. That there is time to stop. It's time to remember what God has done. Not so that we get stuck in the past and think the past was where it was really at. That's when God moved. But so that it builds our faith for the future. So that we look back and see, remember how God came when we had nothing. Now let me pray for a little bit more. Remember when I prayed for that one person at work and then they came to Alpha? Well, now I'm going to pray for everybody at work and pray they come to Alpha. How can it increase our faith? I've asked my housemate Amy to come and sing a song over us, and David's going to kind of come and, uh, and play with her. And so uh, if they just want to kind of get ready, and they're going to come and sing a song that's all about remembering. And during this time, I really want you to have the opportunity to sit and think about what God has done in your life. 
You might want to jot some things down. You might want to write it on a communication card in front of you. You might want to put it on your notepad. I'm going to ask you this week in your connect groups to share these stories because it's not just for you to remember. It's for everybody in this room to be impacted by your story of what God's done. And you can receive the, the impact of their stories of them sharing as well. So I'm going to ask Amy to come and sing. Uh, and I'm going to ask you just to start, try and have a little reflect and thank God in your own heart. So I'm going to pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for who you are. God, I pray we never forget who our God is. We never forget how great you are, how mighty you are, how sovereign you are. I pray that we never get so fixated on our problems, on ourselves, on what's right in front of us, that we forget everything that has gone before us. And God, I ask that today we take a moment to thank you. We take a moment to reflect, that you'll bring things back to remembrance. And even if people are sort of thinking, well, I've not really been a Christian, I don't know what God's done, that we we can just thank you for the very breath in our lungs right now. We can thank you that we woke up this morning. We thank you, God, that there's gravity that is holding us, that the solar system is all perfectly in the place, that we walk day to day in miracles. God, and I pray that we don't take any of those for granted, but we choose to remember. Amen.